would like to go ahead and get started if it's okay with our panelists. We have a good chunk of attendees here. I think we might have some stragglers coming in, but I want to leave plenty of time for our panelists to give their insights. So I will just make a few introductory remarks and then we will kick off our Q&A. I wanna just thank all of our attendees who are here today for, for showing your, taking time out of your schedule to do this. We really appreciate it and look forward to a robust discussion. Our webinar today is being presented by Loyola Law School's Transactional Lawyering Institute which offers experiential learning opportunities for students interested in the practice of transactional business law. In addition to our courses, the Institute features speaker events such as today's webinar and alumni events that you may have attended in the past. We also offer pro bono opportunities to our students and we help link our students to externships to gain real life experience. If you are not already on our mailing list, please feel free to reach out to me after today and I'll be sure to add you. Today, we're thrilled to have with us several members of the advisory board to the Institute. Founder Therese Maynard will be co-moderating with me, and I know we have tons of her former students in the audience. We're also gonna be guided by the insight of Scott Alderton, founding partner of Stubbs, Alderton, and Markleys, Christine Fitzgerald, co-chair of Catton's Los Angeles real estate practice and a member of her firm's reopening committee, Kendra Jones, general counsel of Epson America, and Jeff Sklar, co-founding partner of Sklar Kirsch. So thank you all for being here today. Each of our panelists has been intimately involved with planning and managing the reopening or the planned reopening of the respective places of business. And I know they have lots of great insight to offer to us. The format for today's webinar will first feature a discussion with our panelists based on some of their shared and also unique experiences with managing workplace issues in this pandemic. We expect that that portion of the discussion will take about 25 minutes and then we want to leave the rest of the time for questions and answers from attendees. So if you look at the bottom of your screen, you'll see that there's a chat button with a message bubble. And if you have any questions at the outset or that come up as you listen to what our speakers are saying, please use that feature to lob in your questions. We'll be monitoring that list as the time goes on and we'll try to cover everyone's questions as best as possible. We do have quite a large audience here today, so if we don't get to your question, it's just because we ran out of time. I wouldn't be a lawyer if I didn't include a disclaimer, so I do wanna just mention that today's uh, session is not intended to be legal advice, nor is it a roadmap for how to reopen your firm or your company. Rather, the speakers today are sharing their perspectives on a variety of workplace issues and help us think through some of the challenges that are facing employers and attorneys. We also want to try to envision what the future of the workplace can and perhaps should look like. So with that, let's go ahead and get started. I think it would help provide context to everyone if we would go around the group here of panelists and just share the current state of affairs of your firm or company. Have you reopened your physical office at this time? So Kendra, if you wouldn't mind going first, please. Absolutely. Um, Epson America is uh, regional headquarters for um, Epson's operations in North and Latin America. We have several thousand employees in North and Latin America. We have um, two fully functional and operational warehouse facilities in California and Indianapolis that have remained open during the pandemic as we're in central business. Um, our headquarters and other regional offices in North and Latin America are predominantly work from home. I would say about 95% work from home. We also have uh, manufacturing in Brazil that remains open. Okay, and then Christy, a Catton? Yeah, so Catton has uh, six major offices across the United States and a handful of international offices and about 700 attorneys. Um, as Shannon mentioned earlier, I serve on our firm's nationwide office re-entry committee and we have team members on that committee um, across every job category at Catton. Um, so far, Catton's largely not reopened its offices. Um, each of the major offices has um, maybe one to two folks that go in each day to handle things like mailroom and copy center. But other than that, um, there are not attorneys back at the office, uh, with the exception of our Dallas office. So our Dallas office entered into phase one of our re-entry plan um, early in June. And that involves uh, about up to 20% of the normal workforce being in the office at any given day. Um, as of right now, we don't have active plans to reopen any of the other offices currently. We're sort of sitting tight and seeing how things develop before 
activating any of the early phases of our reentry plans. Thanks for that. And Scott, mm -hmm. how about Stubbs? So Stubbs, Allerton, and Markley's is a 40 per 40-ish lawyer law firm uh, with two physical offices, one in our main lawyer office in Sherman Oaks, where, where the lawyers are housed in a typical high-rise office building structure. And then, as many of you probably know, we have a, a, a unique office in Santa Monica on the promenade that we call the Precelerator, which is an early stage technology incubator uh, for companies. And we have reopened. We reopened in uh, relatively early in June. Uh, we have gone, I think, what are, we, we've implemented procedures which are well beyond the CDC procedures for constant sanitizing and cleaning and, um, you know, mask wearing and social distancing within the office. And we, you know, we, we, we spaced out, you know, workstations and chairs and all that kind of thing. And then having said that, it's a totally no pressure optional um, come to work environment. So I would say of our, call it 60-ish people who would typically work in the office, there's less than a dozen who have been working in the office on a regular basis. Nobody's pressured to come to the office. Everyone is permitted and allowed to do their jobs remotely and continue to do their jobs remotely. We gave some consideration to reshutting down after Governor Newsom's latest order, but we've chosen not to, to keep the office open, it's simply because we're not pressuring anybody to be here who doesn't want to be here and doesn't want to work in this environment. I'm probably also, as a manager, I'm probably at f further from the end of the spectrum of most people who are really concerned about the pandemic issues. I'm obviously con concerned about the pandemic issues for my people, but I'm also concerned about what being remote does to your culture and your firm. And so we're trying to pay attention to those kinds of issues as well. The Precelerator is still closed. It's operating in a virtual capacity. We are still incubating companies and we are still giving them program and accountability and all of that, but we are not physically in that space. Hey, that's helpful context. And, and you see, we have a variety of flavors here today. So Jeff, let's, let's end this question with you, please. Sure. <clears throat> Sklar Kirsch is a 35-person uh, boutique law firm. Our main office is in Century City, and we have a satellite office in Pasadena. We've been closed in terms of working in the office since March 12th, so it's been quite a while now that we've been remote. I think we might have gone out a week before uh, a lot of other people did. We are still in a remote posture, and I anticipate we're going to be in a remote posture probably for uh, maybe even up to the end of the year. We're just watching and seeing what happens out there. Uh, we have one person who works in the office simply to get the mail, send it out to the lawyers by email, uh, and somebody goes in to cash the checks, which we've got to, we need to keep the lights on. But uh, besides that, we are full remote and not allowing people to work from the office. Okay, so, so that's all helpful ground, I think, to, to lay for the rest of this discussion. So I know this next question could probably take up the rest of the day if we wanted it to, but I thought I'd ask to pose to both Scott and Kendra, what are some of the biggest challenges that your workplace is facing today in the midst of this pandemic environment and the uncertainty that has come along with it? And if to the extent that you have come up with any solutions or are kind of working towards that, if you could share those, that would be great. Yeah. Do you want to go first or do you want me to go? Sure, I'll, I'll, I'll go first. So, because my perspective might be a little bit different. So, I mean, we, we have the same challenges that, that everybody has, you know, trying to deal with being remote. Um, uh, if, candidly, I think every law firm has found that, um, that, that, the, that the actual sort of, you know, physical infrastructure challenges are pretty easy to deal with. We, um, like, uh, like Jeff said, we, we, we're a boutique firm too, and we went out really early. We went out in like the first week of March, and, and it was remarkably easy to get re everybody remote, get people the equipment they had. We, we were all, we're, we're a technology-oriented law firm, so we embrace technology, so people literally could just pick up their, their desk office phone and take it home and plug it in, and it's just like they're in the office from a, our, our phone system works through the cloud like they're in the office. Um, obviously, you know, all of our document management and email and everything's on the cloud. So it, it was remarkably easy to get remote uh, and to work remote. And then 
from there, we're dealing with the challenges um, with with the non-physical and infrastructure challenges, which are the which are the difficult ones. Um, you know, how do you keep a cohesive uh, culture? How do you keep everybody motivated? Uh, how do you keep um, uh, everybody, you know, active and embraced in the environment? Um, as, as a manager, I think you fear at the front end of this productivity. That's not turned out to be a problem at all. Uh, people are engaged and productive and hours are certainly there when there's time for people to be billed. Um, we have both a general corporate transactional practice and a, a business litigation practice. The business litigation practice is a little slow because the courts are closed, um, but, but not as slow as you might otherwise think just because the courts are closed. There's still a lot of activity, but our corporate practice is just off the hook. It's been above budget for the last three months and we're, we're blessed to be really busy. My concerns are the challenge are the more long-term challenges. I'm, you know, culture has always been really super important for us. And, you know, we hire based on culture, we retain based on culture, we treat people in a certain way. And um, uh, what I'm, I'm trying to learn as much as I can through this, like everybody else. And I'm trying to talk to as many people both within and outside my organization as I can. I think younger people generally tend to be skewed more towards this is great and this could last forever and we could just do this like this because it's perfectly fine. And, and older people like myself know how we built our practices and how we built our firm and we know that there's glue that, that those young people aren't necessarily seeing. And I think, you know, real building relationships, uh, I, I'm challenged by how are we going to continue to build relationships, maintain, uh, you know, interpersonal contact and relationships with clients and people in your business networks. How are you going to build and foster business networks? Because at least I did that by shaking people's hands and going to, to you know, speaking engagements and eating a lot of crappy, uh, you know, conference food and doing all that kind of stuff. That's how I, that's how we built Stubbs Alton and Markley's. So I'm concerned for, I don't think it's as simple as, oh, we all went remote. It was easy. So we're all fine. I don't think it's that simple. Um, from my, from my perspective and from the perspective of uh, company counsel for Epson, um, the technology issues going remote, I also agree, were quite simple. We were also we were already very well set up technology from a technology's perspective to go remote. But um, I partner with our VP of HR and our COO. We have a COVID committee that meets daily to talk about the challenges of, um, of what we're experiencing and our plans for reopening. And as we've gone through the pandemic, we've and we have such a large workforce, we have had to deal with positive COVID cases. Um, and I think one of the challenges that we've really had is the timeliness of information. Um, I think if you have a large workforce, uh, you're used to people not coming in because they call in sick. But um, what might be a headache one day might three or four days later turn into COVID symptoms. And if you haven't stayed in contact with that person, you might not have the most current up-to-date information in case you need to take action within your facility or within your office to do a deep cleaning or do contact tracing. Um, so we really had, took us a while, you know, to, to figure out how to get the most timely and most accurate information because you can't wait around for a positive test result to make decisions and take action um, because it, uh, depending on where you're at, it could take days and, and those days are really important to make sure you're you're reacting to what's going on in your in your office or in your warehouse, um, and so one of the solutions we have found, uh, one of the things that's really helped us is hiring nurses uh, for each facility, and we have those nurses check in on every individual who um, calls in sick. Um, they can check, they can check in with the nurse if they don't feel well while they're in the office. We can assess if it's likely or not likely to be COVID, we can recommend they get tested. Um, so really having someone, having an, a, a licensed nurse nurse to, to manage all of that checking in, um, discussing symptoms, helping us decide when it's the right time to bring someone back in conjunction with CDC guidelines. Um, it's, it's, it's not easy. And I think just feeling like you have that medical professional uh, some companies already have medical professional on staff. We did not, 
but adding that to um, our committee work has just been an incredibly helpful and, and giving us more peace of mind that we're making the fast decisions as possible to make sure we're, we're, we're doing the right, taking the right steps. Yeah, that's interesting perspective. And obviously every com company is going to be a little bit different and, and firm in terms of size and, and resources. So shifting gears for a moment, um, I think we've all realized the pandemic has clearly accelerated this shift to a remote work environment. It had been kind of percolating over the last couple of years, depending on what type of workplace you were involved with. And, and then suddenly it was just kind of thrust upon us back in March. And there certainly have been some perks to this change. I think that most people are happy with reduced commutes and little to no business travel, as well as maybe more informal uh, office attire. But clearly there are some potential downsides of remote work. And I think that as we think about this, that there are some aspects of remote work that could well create obstacles to making the workplace a more inclusive environment, which is such an important issue these days. So um, Christy, Christy, I know you have some really interesting thoughts on this and wanted to just give you a chance to talk about that. Thanks, Shannon. Um, yes, in our reentry committee and also at a practice group level, We've been talking, you know, ever since we went remote um, about many of these issues um, and trying to figure out how they interact with our re-entry plan. Um, I think one kind of unusual thing that has come up is that, you know, now everyone is working remote at my firm. So it has, to some extent, leveled the playing field. Um, I had the benefit of working in a practice group where there were a lot of attorneys already working remotely. I think every attorney in our practice group worked remotely at least one day a week on a regular basis, and some attorneys worked 100% remotely already. So some of the um, uh, perceived negative impact of remote working that we were already experiencing has actually gone away during this 100% remote working environment. Um, so for instance, you know, perceptions that other attorneys at the firm might have, uh, negative perceptions of people who were working remotely. Now everybody's, you know, on the same playing field. So for instance, we no longer have to pretend that we're not working remotely to pretend like we're actually in the office. Um, my practice group has connected more with each other through regularly scheduled virtual meetings than we actually did before when it was so difficult to find a time to get everybody in the same room for some FaceTime. Um, we found that attorneys previously would hesitate to communicate with us or to reach out to us if it were, weren't the attorneys we work with on a day-to-day -day basis because they were waiting until the time when we were in the office and they could communicate with us face-to-face. -face. Um, and also nobody feels anymore that if you're not in the office, you might be missing out on opportunities to connect with people or to put in FaceTime and be seen that you're doing that. So. We have some concerns actually about the reentry process where once again, uh, attorneys won't really be on that level playing field. There will be some back in the office and some will still be working remotely and whether that will create some of these negative perceptions of remote working attorneys that perhaps existed before and how to um, manage so that doesn't happen. Um, Another and related issue to that is um, the intersection of my firm's inclusivity and diversity goals, as well as attorney well-being goals with the office reentry program. So when you start to think about reentry to the office, and again, um, just like Scott and Jeff had said, my firm's reentry uh, process is going to be entirely voluntary. So once they do start a phased reopening of the office, only attorneys that want to go into the office um, will be required to go into the office. And that is planned to continue until such time as, you know, COVID is no longer an issue. So how does that voluntary return to the office intersect with our firm's inclusivity goals and attorney well-being goals? Um, some of the questions that we're asking ourselves is, when we do open the offices, who's going to return first and why? Um, so for instance, will there be more senior attorneys and partners going back to the office, um, either because they don't have the same commute issues that more junior attorneys might have? Um, and if so, if there's more senior attorneys back in the office, um, what, um, 
what does that cause in the junior attorneys that they're working with? How does that cause them to react? Um, what if there's more male attorneys that end up returning to the office earlier? Because more of our female attorneys might have childcare obligations that are not being satisfied with schools and camps and other um, childcare facilities that are no longer reopening or haven't reopened yet. Um, so how do we as leaders of the firm ensure that those who return to the office and those who are continuing to work remotely for an extended period are treated fairly and equally? So will the attorneys that are back in the office be more visible to the senior attorneys that are back in the office and therefore be perceived to be more available and more committed and higher performing? Um, how do you make sure that attorneys that are back in the office and attorneys that are working remotely get assigned the same quality of work and the same sophistication level of work um, and the same client development opportunities? Um, we're also concerned about attorneys who feel pressure to return to the office, not because the firm is telling them they have to, but they feel like in order to advance their career, they need to return to the office. And maybe that is added on to the pressure of the responsibilities they have at home because of COVID. And so are we creating higher levels of stress and anxiety for our attorneys um, and reducing their overall well-being? Um, and we're also struggling with how we as a firm treat working parents um, in this crisis because we recognize that many of our working parents have no good options. They're basically doing three jobs. At the same time, they're you know, performing their job as an attorney, their childcare obligations, as well as educating their own children. So what is the fairest and most inclusive way to make allowances to working parent attorneys um, and to give leeway to parents during this unprecedented time? And how does firm leadership educate other non-parent attorneys um, as to the challenges that are currently being faced by working parents and maybe help educate people to reframe the line between personal life and work and create some space for working, parent, working parents to perform effectively in a different way? Um, you know, for instance, we're asking questions like, is it ever appropriate for attorneys' children to appear on video conferences and um, acknowledging issues that remote working parents face like noise issues, you know, scheduling issues and prioritizing issues. So these are many of the questions we've been actively discussing about the re-entry process and the split between remote working and actual back in the office physical working um, that we're gonna be facing pretty soon with our office reentry plan. Well, well, that sure is a lot of food for thought. Um, <laughs> yeah. and, and I think I think many of us, even on the panel, can can really relate to some of these issues. So I, on a similar note, I, I know that I've heard from some of you that you've had some really interesting initiatives that you have been undertaking, to either, whether to build morale or to try to increase cohesiveness in this environment and just kind of envisioning what that might look like also when some people are back physically in the office and some are not. And so Jeff and Kendra, I was hoping that you could share just concretely some of the things that your firm has done. And Scott, if you want to chime in as well, to, to try to build morale and foster this sense of inclusiveness. Sure. Kendra, shall I take this one first? Go ahead. Okay, great. So it's been an evolution because in the beginning when we didn't know what was happening in March and April and we, you know, genuinely didn't know what the future held in terms of, we still don't know what the future holds, but we literally didn't know what the future held economically for us at that moment, week to week. It was very much a batten down the hatches moment. And we had to decide as management, how, how are you going to handle that? because the way you handle that goes directly to morale. And the way we handle that is transparency. Uh, and that's the way we've continued to handle it through the entire crisis and the way we will continue to handle it. Transparency about how the firm is doing. Transparency about what we think is going to happen and, and what we're gonna do, what's, on, what's our menu of options and what we're thinking about. You can't overdo it to make people crazy, but I think people like to know to the extent they can, where they stand. And that, that's really helped with our entire team 
in terms of alleviating, believe it or not, anxiety by giving them some visibility, you know, letting them know, are there staffing changes planned? Are there not? Those sorts of conversations can start to put minds at ease a little bit in a time that's obviously very difficult. On the flip side of that, you know, that's sort of the transparency, hard conversation part of it. We've had a lot of fun activities. We've, we've really worked hard to have contests and happy hours like everyone's doing and bring your dog on Zoom day and, you know, all these sorts of things that frankly just come up with some reasons where we, to Scott's point, can maintain our culture. Uh, you, you, you know, a firm is more than just a bundle of lawyers and staff. It really, it's like a, a rock band. It's chemistry, right? And, and you need to continue really playing the music together. So we do our best to try to bring people together, create opportunities for that to happen, not just when we're working and we're on conference calls or whatever, but even if it's a half hour, just to shoot the breeze with each other and say hi. And I'll say lastly, as a manager, I have my department meetings every other week, but in alternating weeks, I do one-on-one -on -one phone calls with my team. I think that the one-on-one -on -one conversation with my team members bring something different than the department meeting. And so I've, I've found that mixing that up is, is, is helpful for me and that's what I've been doing. And I, would, and I would echo a lot of what Jeff said in terms of um, transparency and communication being really the key to maintaining morale, certainly through the pandemic. Um, We've had every two to three weeks, our CEO will do a videotaped uh, message to the employee base to talk about where we stand as an organization, you know, what policies we're adopting, what, what's changing, um, what our plans are, and as they've been evolving in terms of how long we'll be working from home, talking about some major wins in the business so that we can continue to be excited about where our business is going despite, you know, some current challenges. And you know, just having that regular communication for, from our perspective, from the CEO, and then of course I have individual meet, weekly meetings with my team, just continually having that dialogue so that people understand where the business is at. People are afraid about job preservation. And I think that continual message from senior leadership about how the company or the law firm is doing is just really important. And then to, and then we also really just wanted to get some feedback from our employee base about how we're doing. So we implemented a, a survey, an, an anonymous survey to the entire workforce and really just wanted to get feedback. How, how are things going? How are we doing? What do you like? What don't you like? What are you worried about coming back? And just making sure that we know and understand what's in our, you know, what our employee base is feeling and so that we can make sure we're addressing those issues as we develop our return to work plan um, and make sure we're communicating. Even a lot of the good things we're, we are doing, we realize weren't necessarily fully communicated or understood. So it was a, I really I recommend doing that, um, particularly if you have a large employee base to make sure everyone feels like they have a voice and that their opinion matters. And, and then of course, be transparent with the results. We fully um, disseminated the results of that survey so that everybody understood um, kind of where we were at and we were really happy with the results. And, and I'll just take, a, I'll just take a really quick second. Oh, my echoing. Uh, I'll just take a really quick second and just, um, cause like, cause this is a unanimous, it's unanimous. I mean, I think transparency and communication is absolutely the key. We're not, we're not, we must not be as fun of a law firm as Sklar Kirsch because we're not doing bring the dog on Zoom day um, or things like that. But, um, but we have upped our departmental meeting uh, schedule and we're starting to start, we're even now starting to do more of that in even, we're not very departmental as a firm, but we're starting to do it that, w that way more now uh, and try to have meetings with all associates and things like that. Um, and we're small enough that I can literally uh, just get on Microsoft Teams, you know, once a month and just talk to virtually every lawyer in the firm, which I try to do. Um, and the, the last thing I'll say is that, is that, you know, people are nervous about this, obviously, and they, if, they, if there's a vacuum of information, then their own imagination fills in the vacuum. So, you know, like you reach a point where like everybody knows that our litigation department is slower because 
the courts are closed, but then all the litigators think they're being fired, you know, even though nobody's suggested that. And, and so you have to constantly be talking to people and have communication. Yeah, thanks for that. So we're coming up sort of towards the end of our discussion. We left the, uh, the trickiest question for last. And uh, to our attendees, please feel free to start firing away with questions if you have them or anything that's been sparked, your, your curiosity from this discussion. But I wanted to just sort of close here. Oh, Therese? Can I, I, before you close, I, I have given the communi- I just have one question. Oh, well, I, we were going to, I think, go to the, the future question first. I, before we go to the future, okay. can okay. I ask about what they've, what they've been saying just now? Um, is that okay? Because okay? in the communications that you're having, um, whether they're in your department or one-on-one, is, do you see a theme as to what the members of your community are worried about? Has it changed over time from the beginning to now? Is it, is it, uh, is, do you see, to the extent you can generalize, do you see anything um, in your own communities that people tend to be more worried about? I think that it depends on who's asking. Is, yeah. is the way I would answer that question. If if I'm a junior lawyer, uh, I'm concerned about training. I'm concerned about making sure I'm going to stay busy. I'm concerned about my job security. Uh, if I'm a more senior lawyer, you know, I'm focused on deal flow and business development. And you know, how are we doing financially? And you know, sort sort of uh, there's like a spectrum of concerns that all need to be addressed depending on who's asking, you know. I don't have anything to add. I agree. I completely agree. Good. So I do. So So if we had a crystal ball here, where do you see this environment taking us? I mean, and that's, I know that's a tough question. We have news from the governor changing every other, you know, every few days for, for folks and, Um, I think a lot of you have addressed these issues in our discussion earlier today in terms of what the workplace might look like and the importance of building relationships and the importance of continued transparency and communication. But if you if you were able to sort of envision the workplace and maybe even craft it as you would like to see it in the future going forward, what would what would that look like and we can go around for the full group here and I see we start we're starting to have some questions come in as well, which is great. So who's the lucky first one? Jeff, do you want to kick that one off or, or Scott? Well, I'll jump in because I've taken the plunge. I just signed a, a lease on a full floor of my building, a second full floor of my building. So I'm bold about the future. Um, and look, the reality is, is that we all have a crystal ball, but they're all cloudy. And the reality is, is that this will be behind us. That's a hundred percent certain. This will be behind us. And um, the, this isn't my original thought, but I heard somebody say at one of these things I was talking that that's sort of like, we've been on a progression of moving to more technology and remoteness and, and all of that kind of stuff. And I think what this has done is rapidly accelerate that process, the process we were already on and would have gotten to anyway. I think we just got there faster, but I, but I think we'll be in offices and I think that um, we'll, be, we'll be socially interacting um, there'll be more remote working, uh, you know, a greater percentage of your day. But I don't envision a world where all of my associates work at home and don't ever come into the office. And I don't envision a world where I only interact with my clients through the screen. I just don't see it. And, and so, um, you know, we're, we're basically all social animals. We need social interaction. We crave social inter- interaction. And it will come back and it'll be different, but, but it'll be back. And so, you know, I'm all in. Now, we, we designed the space that we're doing a little differently than we've designed historically space. So we are doing some hoteling in our, in our new space where we're going to have, you know, generic offices and we're going to basically let every associate and partner in the firm decide um, how they want to conduct their own lawyering. And if they choose to be predominantly remote, then they won't have an office at all. They'll have an office to come into and plug into but they won't have an actual office. And if they choose to predominantly be in the office, even if they're working remotely 30, 40% of the time, then they will have an office to come into that's their own office. And so we're, we're kind of doing a hybrid plan, space planning and technology planning 
which we were well suited to do at the beginning, but, but we're accelerating that now. Yeah, I, I agree with everything Scott's saying. Um, I think that this experience, it, it has moved us more towards the remote, but it's also moved us more towards a thoughtful approach as to what benefits um, there are to doing certain things remotely and benefits for doing in-person things. So I think there's gonna be a lot more thought given rather than we always had this certain type of meeting you know, in person. Now we will be giving thought to whether it makes sense to do that particular type of meeting in person or whether it's something that can more effectively and cost effectively be done remotely and what things really matter for in person, like where do you get the most bang for your buck with getting all the attorneys together? Um, where, where do you get it for doing certain business development activities? Um, and focus our attention on that, whereas the rest of the things that fall into the, can be done just as easily remotely, will now go there so more attention can be given to the actual in-person um, types of meetings and events and uh, other social activities. Yeah. And, and Epson's in the process of building out a brand new headquarters, um, 150,000 square feet of, of new space. And um, we're, you know, it's, it's good timing in a lot of ways because we're able to incorporate changes into the new building that we didn't contemplate when we first started that process. But we certainly don't envision um, not needing that space. Um, I think there will be a permanent change in the way we work. I think hybrid approaches will become the norm, but, you know, whether you're an in-house lawyer um, at a company, you know, or uh, with a law firm, I think building client relationships, wherever they are, face-to-face -face is always going to be really important. And that establishing yourself, an organization, helping build your career, um, so I think hybrid is going to be the way of the future, and we're absolutely you know, excited about it. And I'm and I'm excited how well, you know, how this process accelerated. I think somewhere where we wanted to go longer term, but this kind of just made us get there a lot quicker than we than we would have otherwise. And the only other thing I would add is I think from an uh, employee, you know, from an attorney wellness standpoint. There's really an opportunity in here that you've got your office again and everyone's back who wants to be back, but there's a newfound acceptance to the fact that, hey, this person lives in Idaho, right? That's where they decided to move because that made sense for their family. And that doesn't mean they have to quit the firm. That doesn't, there, there's an opportunity that, to let people's lives adapt a little bit more than maybe conventionally we've allowed within the law. And that's not a terrible thing. So I, th I think that's something that nice that might come out of it. Yeah, whereas other things will go away. No one's getting on a plane anymore and flying to New York for a one hour meeting. That's, that's just never <laughs> happening again. Business travel yeah. is yep. gonna be different. I think yeah. business travel has, will permanently change to some degree, but there's no doubt in my mind. So uh, Therese, did you wanna kick yeah, off some of the Q and A here? Yeah, we do have a few questions, and as a legal educator, uh, uh, one of them is um, quite interesting to me. You know, there's so much uncertainty um, with respect to bar exam and when it's going to be administered. And um, have you, I know for some of you this may have less of an impact, but have you given any thought to um, the uncertainty surrounding whether the bar exam will happen? And the other thing, uh, kind of on a separate basis is, um, the onboarding, uh, how do you, along the lines of what we've been talking about, creating community? And I think this is true not just for the new lawyer hires, but staff and other people. Um, I, I've been very curious about whether you've thought about procedures or protocols or something to implement um, with respect to either the lawyer hires or others. We, we, oh, go ahead. I was just going to say um, a lot of those considerations have come up around Catton's summer program. Um, and we, we have gone forward with our summer program this year. Um, it's entirely virtual and, I, and it's shortened. Um, and we are hiring our summers from last year, although I believe their start date has been delayed 
um, from the fall um, to the beginning of the next year. But, but it's, we've spent a lot of time trying to decide how to forge relationships with the summer associates and also how to work with them um, during an entirely virtual shortened period of time. And so a lot of people more creative than I am have come up with different, I think we're doing like a um, mixology class, for instance, an all virtual mixology class where they deliver to your house the ingredients to make a cocktail or a mocktail. And then we all get on Zoom together and create these. Um, what a great idea. So yeah, it oh, was fun. a great idea. Actually. And I, I did not claim credit for that, but... Um, <laughs> But I think it will be a nice replacement um, for a way to both build relationships and um, make our summer associates feel included. And that can obviously translate over to other, you know, onboarding of other new hires. Um, so those are some of the ideas that are circulating at my firm. But it's an issue. It is. Anybody else? Go ahead, Jeff. You know, I was only to say process wise, the onboarding and, you know, I don't know about other firms, we're doing a little bit of hiring, but nothing in the way of what was going on before, as, as you'd expect. And process wise, it's the same, you know, people need to meet everybody, they need, we still need to have time to build the relationships and try to establish if person is the right culture fit for our firm and so forth. So w granted, it's Zoom based, so that's a little different. But we're still going through our paces and making sure we're doing our diligence on who joins the firm and making sure it will be a good fit. So the, and I, I, go ahead, Scott, please. I, I can't speak to um, the bar exam issues or because we don't hire people out of law school uh, typically until after they've passed the bar. But um, we, we had extended two offers to people who were moving back from New York. Uh, they were both, well, one was in Chicago and one was in New York. And when the, when the pandemic hit, um, one of those people has come and joined and we've, we've uh, integrated her. The other um, has just arrived in California and is about to start next week and be integrated. And like Jeff says, we've done that. Well, we, we actually uh, met with, with um, uh, the, the one who started in physically in person because our office had opened by then. Uh, socially distanced, of course, in the conference room with masks and all of that, and integrated her into the office. And then she immediately went remote, and she has been integrating with the groups through Zoom meetings. And 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 for, fortunately, the department she's in is super busy, so she's gotten inundated with work right away. And um, I'm going to do the same thing with Jeremy, who's starting next week. I'm going to meet with him at the office first, and then he'll go immediately remote. Um, and we are actively looking to hire two lawyers right now—a ju a junior and a senior. And, um, and so I don't know how that's going to necessarily work in terms of the interviewing process and all that. It will obviously be on Zoom. But, um, but uh, like I said, I, I view those as short term issues that the, the, there's going to be a, a vac, you know, there's going to be a, uh, uh, I'm sorry, I'm struggling for the word, not vaccine, but, um, you know, there, there's going to be a solution to COVID. It's going to go away. And then we're all going to be changed forever. But I, I personally believe it's going to be more like it used to be than it is now. Do we have time, Shannon, for another question? I know we're getting close to our which. I think hour. we should keep going. I think it's a, it's a great discussion and, and people seem engaged with it. So uh, I see that a few of the um, uh, younger folks in our audience, like recent grads that are just starting out, um, they were wondering if right now, for the time being, Scott, um, it is remote. Do you have any particular advice um, on things that the individual who's just starting out could think about doing in order to build their career while they have to be in, you know, self sheltering at home and sheltering in place kind of work environment? Any thoughts on that one? Anyone? Yeah. Yeah. Well, my, my thoughts are um, it's all relationship based. You know, you, you build a career. You you start building a career when you're a junior lawyer by developing a broad array of relationships. And, and, you, and, and you don't do it on a quid pro quo basis. You don't expect anything from relationships other than relationships because it's sort of like you're at a level, build relationships with people who are at the level that you're at. And then as the tide rises, those relationships will all rise. You're not going to meet the president of, you know, a major division of Facebook and bring them in as a client, as a second year associate, but you might very well meet 
you know, somebody who's a, who's a significant person at, you know, a phase, a company or a accounting firm or, a you know, management consulting firm or whatever, develop relationships with them. Like I said, you'll do that differently. Now you'll do that by integrating with them wherever they are on zoom, you know, in, in LinkedIn groups and in bar meetings and in, uh, you know, organizations meetings and things like that, but develop those relationships, follow up with them, schedule calls, source all that stuff, and just build the biggest relationship that you can build for two, three, four, five years of your career. Because then what happens is, is that five, six years later, all those people are in some capacity somewhere where they can refer you business and they can be helpful to you in your career. And that's when that all starts to pay off. So it's, it's really, it's all about relationship building and I'm no guru on how to do that in this, you know, the younger people are better at all this than I am, but there it's all going on. But I, I, that's, that's my, my number one takeaway key advice is don't stop building relationships just because you're working in your pajamas and you're not shaving. It's like, like build relationships. And, and I would add to that, adopt Zoom. Um, as, a, as a company, we have adopted Zoom for virtually every meeting we have now. Every meeting invite I get has a Zoom link. It never used to be that way, but it is now. But I have noticed most of the outside law firms I work with have not really gone that direction. Um, you know, they're still sending out dial-in information. And when I add them to my Zoom, they're dialing in. And there still is, even if, I mean, if there is some relationship building that goes on, even when you're just on Zoom, even just seeing a person face to face has an additional impact than the phone call. And especially when you've got, you know, four or five people on a call, you don't maybe know everyone super well. And so you can't always figure out who's saying what. Zoom's extremely helpful. So I mean, adopt what your clients are doing. Yeah, and it's the technology that they have so that you can communicate with them with the way they're used to. I am now, you know, very comfortable and used to doing everything on Zoom. We have a private label version of Zoom through our phone system. And I do exactly what Kendra says. Every time I schedule a call with anybody now, I schedule it with, I schedule a video call and they can choose to turn on the video or not and do it audio if they don't want to do the video. But I let them have that choice and I do it. I always schedule a video because again, it's a personal touch. I completely agree. Jeff, were you going to say yes, I, yeah, go ahead. I would just, oh, sorry. I would just add to what Scott and Kendra were saying that everything about building relationships they just said also applies with the other attorneys that you are working with in your own firm. So um, as a junior attorney, treat the more senior attorneys and the partners that you're working with as you would treat um, potential business development opportunities that Scott was talking about. Um, you know, communicate with them via Zoom instead of calling them. Um, try to forge those relationships um, in the same way as if it were, you know, a client or a potential client relationship. Jeff, did you have something? Yeah, my last thing that, that I was thinking is I, I told my group, I guess, last week that we're no longer on an emergency footing. We are, this is just the way things are now. And we have to get, get on with business. We've got to be networking. We've got to be getting our MCLE credits. We've got to be doing all the things that for the first three months of this pandemic, we were like, oh, my gosh. And, and like, nobody moved. That's got to be over now. We've got to get back, get back to working in this new environment and not wait to network. So if you're a young lawyer and there's, charities that you want to be involved in, the young professional organizations or the bar association things or whatever you want to attend. There's a million things going on out there you can do on Zoom, get to know people, join committees, don't wait for whatever is going on in the world right now to end because God knows when it's going to end. Just get on with it. So along those lines, as an educator, one of the things that I was on a webinar before this one about um, best practices for online teaching. And one of the things that comes up all the time is how do you cultivate in this new world order of Zoom, how do you cultivate norms of professionalism and behavior and, you know, basic things are coming up like that are going to get sort of built into the syllabus. Like you must have your camera on and what, you know, when is it okay to turn your camera off? And, and I was thinking if you're a new lawyer, how are you going to 
How are you going to figure out what the, what the norms are to be a professional? Any thoughts? Uh, you know, as a legal educator, and we have some young folks in our audience out there, young lawyers, any thoughts on how to go about tackling that? Or? Well, in my view, it's just like if you're going to an event and you're not sure what to wear, overdress. It's like, <laughs> you know, you, it's embarrassing to be underdressed. It's not embarrassing to be overdressed. So, you know, having, and it depends on the context, but, you know, having, you know, your, your kids walk by in the background or your dog, you know, in the video and all that kind of stuff. I mean, that's fine. Everybody realizes that's happening, but, you know, take your game to the right level. And particularly if the, if the meeting is, you know, like I don't wear a nice dress shirt every day to every day to work now in this farm because I don't need to, but I'm on a zoom call with, you know, a hundred people and this is an important event. And so I wore a nicer dress shirt. It's like, take it to the level that it needs to be at and be professional. It's really sort of, don't try to fit. Don't try to think about what norm you need to fit in. Just do what you would do that makes you look good. Anybody else? Yeah, I, I would just add to that. I think everybody is trying to figure that out, not just entry lawyers um, to some extent. So, you know, asking questions and talking with your peers, talking with your mentors about what, you know, they think about some of those questions can only be helpful because I don't know that, you know, more senior, more senior people at our firm or even clients are, have figured out for themselves what all that should look at and what the norm is. I'm not sure there is a norm yet. Um, so open discussion, I think, is is a good answer to that. <laughs> Shannon, or what do you think on timing? Well, we, we are, one of our biggest goals in this webinar was <laughs> not to cross any Zoom fatigue in the middle of your day. So I think that with a couple minutes to spare in the hour, we should probably try to wrap it up. I. I know whenever I've met with this group, Teresa and I have constantly commented on how fun it is to hear from you, and we always learn something new, and I hope that the attendees here have as well. So um, if you want to reach out individually, please please feel free to reach out to Teresa or me, and um, we hope to continue events like this in the future with the Institute, whether in person or on the screen. We, of course, really, really relish the day when we can do this in person again, but in the meantime, stay well, everyone, and please be in touch with us. And I'm Thank not hard to find, time. so any of the attendees who had questions for me that didn't get answered, reach out. Yes, and thank you all for, for um, participating, and there are ways to engage in our virtual world with the Transactional Lawyering Institute, so if you're interested, please let us know. Um, we want to continue to build. Great, well, thank you. Take care. Thank you. Thanks, Thank you. Thanks, Teresa. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Bye, everyone. Bye. Bye. -bye.